Turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 as we continue through uh, what many have called the fifth gospel written by Dr. Luke. Uh, an autopatia or an autopsy of the body of Christ and the early birth of it. And that's what we've actually been looking at in Acts chapter 2. Uh, the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles, as I like to remind you of that, so we remember that. We're living in an age where we're tossing out the Holy Spirit and we're trying to finish in the flesh what was started by the Spirit of God. And if we are born again and we believe in Jesus, then we receive the Spirit. And our new life is with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being taught by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Everything that we do is in the Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. Now, if you remember, chapter 2 began with, um, on the day of Pentecost, they have what was a great and mighty wind. Or at least it sounded like a great and mighty wind, but nothing was moving. And then they had the tongues as a fire on their head, but nothing was burned up. And, and during that, you know, people come around and everybody heard it. And they said, some of them said, whatever could this mean? And then others mocked and said they are full of new wine. And if you'll remember with me, Peter stands up and that's what we're in the middle of. We're in the middle of this, the first sermon of the church. Uh, what an amazing sermon it is. It's going to uh, culminate in verse 41 with 3,000 people. Uh, what we call getting saved, but it actually says, listen, in 41, those, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Notice the language that's used. They received, they received his word. He gave testimony. He gave witness. He quotes scripture. In some ways, he actually alludes to or quotes up to 20 different uh, areas of Old Testament scripture as you read this. Up to 20. And that's what he's actually quoting and saying in his own words because he's hidden it in his heart. And now by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit draws it out. And that's why we encourage you to get into the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship. When you're reading your Bible and hiding God's truth in your heart, then the Holy Spirit can draw it out to share it with other people, and then they have a chance to receive His words and then be delivered from the sin nature. And so when we close last week, we're really all the way through uh, verse 24 but I want to back up just for a moment and kind of take a, a look at uh, verse 22. I'm going to read it, but we're going to be beginning at verse 25 this week. But I want to read just for context. We'll start at 22 again. And you'll see that he's speaking clearly to just the nation of Israel. The gospel was first to Israel and then to the Jew. First to the Jews and then to the Greeks, uh, uh, Paul tells us over in Romans 1.16. And he said he was not ashamed of it. Once he come to salvation, he was not ashamed. So 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, this is who we're going to talk about, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So we know that many of them stand in there, had seen and heard and, and witnessed the same miracles and wonders and signs that Jesus did. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. And then verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And now that's what 25 in our text today is going to explain to us. Why is it not possible that he could be held by the pangs of death, by the grave? For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope 
For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to seek corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the, of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the, all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the evidence that you received his payment of blood for the purchase of your bride, for the purchase uh, of our souls, Lord, that we can be forgiven of our sins and receive a new nature and be birthed back into your family um, as children of God, led by your Spirit. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Have your way with us. Help us to understand uh, this first sermon of the church and to see the work of the Holy Spirit even in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, it was not possible, verse 24, the end of it, uh, that the, not possible that he could be held by the grave. Uh, for David says himself, David says concerning him. And, and then he's going to quote, um, uh, what is it, Psalms one, uh, 16, uh, 8 through 11. He quotes a psalm where David is writing a psalm, a song that he would sing praise to God or speak to God. But notice, for David says, for David says, now listen, it wasn't just that David said that David said it by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. David can't write about the Messiah that he doesn't fully understand in his resurrection uh, without the Holy Spirit's unction upon him and anointing upon him. And, and you know, we're told in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that all scripture is inspired by God. It's the inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped, ready for every good work. And so when David is writing down, and he's writing his little song or his sonnet or his psalm, whatever you want to call it, the little poem, he's actually writing about himself and what's going on. But God uses it in a twofold way to point forward to the Messiah who is going to come, which is amazing. David is sharing his heart about his life. He's talking about what's going on in his life, giving his testimony of people chasing him and trying to kill him and how God has delivered him and how he's walking through these things. And it actually applies perfectly to the Messiah. Because God inspired him to write it that way. And so when you go out and you're talking to people and you're sharing your testimony, you're being a witness about the things you've seen and heard, and then you're telling what God is doing in your life, it speaks directly into their life, the oracles of God, the very word of God. And you share hope and truth with them and they can see that their life can change also. So it's very important that we be able to do that. And notice... Everything that Peter is doing, he's setting a precedent of first. There's always the, 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 the biblical consistency of first usages. You always want to understand that. Now, if you apply that to the very first sermon, how is he explaining everything? He's explaining it from Scripture. If you can't explain it from Scripture, you need to be aware of it. You need to be careful with it if it's not going on, okay? Listen to me. Like Easter services. Easter is 
is a, a, a false god, a Babylonian god. A god. Uh, it's from the, the word Ishtar, which is I-S-H-T-A-R. But they're both pronounced Easter. They're both pronounced the exact same way. And, and Constantine brought Easter into the church when he wanted to Christianize the entire, the, the entire world. And he brought the celebration of Easter in. This is Resurrection Sunday. Bunnies don't lay eggs. Listen, it doesn't take a first grader to understand that. Bunnies don't lay eggs. So why would we act like they do? You know, she was a fertility god. I mean, and, and that's what it's about. It's, it's, it's a goddess of sexual love, not a god of love. It's not about a god of love. A god of love died on a cross and rose again on the third day so that you and I could raise in the resurrection. But we're not going to raise in the resurrection unless we receive his words and then we plant ourselves in the ground by dying. We're crucified with Christ. We die with Christ. And then we can raise in the resurrection of life. Everybody's raising. There's going to be a resurrection of life and a resurrection of death. One day. In the last day. And people will rise to the resurrection of death and go to hell. And people will rise in the resurrection of life. And they'll be with Christ forever. And we have a choice. There's only two paths. There's not a whole bunch of paths. There's not a whole bunch of, of, of real gods. There's only one true God. And he says there's salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. And listen, David foresaw it. Look at what we're reading here. David foresaw it. For 25, for David says concerning him, I foresaw. Look at this. He foresaw it. Are you guys with me? He's in the Old Testament. Some 2,000 years before, and he foresaw it. It's the word pro oreo. It means to behold in advance, to see before, to, uh, to actively to notice. The root word is actually to mean to discern clearly. Why? Because he received God's word, and he received and discerned and judged clearly that God was going to bring a Messiah, that God was going to save them. And so David foresaw the Lord always before my face. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. And it just means continually before my face, in his presence, in his sight. And he knew that God was with him. He wrote, when he penned Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And, you know, and I love that word make because you, most of the time you hear make, it's like, I'll make you get that done. I'll make you do that. I'll make you. It's not force. Because the Lord is his shepherd and because he sees the goodness and the love of God, that word has the connotation just seeing his mercy, just seeing his grace, just foreseeing him before him in his presence always. What does he do? It makes him want to willingly fall down and worship, to willingly eat the green grass that God has provided and, and, and do what God wants and not keep doing what he wants. See, being self-will is what leads us to hell. But when we willingly choose to bow down and to be like a seed that goes into the ground and dies, and that's what happens really with our bodies. You know, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that. That the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall meet the Lord in the air. So they're actually in the ground, and then they get up the same way Jesus did. They get up first, and then we meet them in the air. And so that raises up out of the ground, just like a seed that you throw into the ground, right? And then it germinates, and then all of a sudden you see that little sprout popping up out of the dirt. And it starts to bear fruit, and it's growing. And that's the way we're supposed to do now spiritually is deny self. To be dead to self and allow God to water us with the Holy Spirit and his word and begin to grow fruit in our lives. Anyway, so uh, I probably should just go to this text and look at it, shouldn't we? Uh, let's just go to Psalm 16 and let's look at the whole psalm as David writes it. Psalm 16, because that's what he's quoting. And we probably could look at that a little bit easier. Um, Psalm 16, 
And I love it because in a minute we're going to see the commentary. Peter, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is going to give us the commentary of what David was saying. But when you just read Psalm 16, you don't glean that from it. You go, oh, David's going through some stuff. But then Peter tells us exactly what was going on. Look what he says first. It's Psalm 16, 1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. Preserve me. Save me from the death. Bring me back from the dead, as if Christ is speaking this to us. And yet David is talking about it for his life. O oh, my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. Listen, we have nothing, nothing apart from God. You are, we are nothing. The only good thing that can dwell in us is Christ. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are all excellent ones in whom is all my delight. And I love that because over in, I think it's Proverbs 8, 31, when it, there's a personification of wisdom before God and he grew up as a master craftsman and his delight was always with the sons of men. And he knew that he was going to come. Christ knew that he was going to come. He's the wisdom of God. He knew that he was going to come and die for the sins of the world. He was going to come down and die for us. It was always his delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. What are you seeking after? What are you hastening after? What hurries you up in the morning? What are you running for? Is it idols? Is it some other God? Or are you seeking God? Are you seeking the Yahweh? Are you seeking the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Are you seeking His green fields that feed you and nourish you? Are you content with what God is doing in your life? Because sometimes we think, oh, I'm going through some stuff. Sometimes we, our sorrows are multiplied because we're looking in the wrong direction. We're not following close behind. We're not being led by the Holy Spirit but our eyes are on every other idol and every other thing and every other ism. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer nor take up their names on my lips. He's not going to confess them before the Father. If you confess him before the Father, he'll confess you before the holy angels. I mean, it's just, it's just part of what we do when we make witness. Oh, Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. Everything. Uh, he's sovereign over it all. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. And so uh, David praising him. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. Where are you getting your counsel? Who are you trusting in? My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. Maybe he's dreaming dreams, having visions. That's something that Joel said we're going to do in these last days, uh, but in the night seasons. Uh, now, verse 8, and this is what he quotes from Acts 2. This is exactly what uh, uh, Peter is being reminded of and brought to his memory, remembrance by the Holy Spirit is this new beginning. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now listen to me. What are you setting before you? What are you setting before you? And then what is your strength? Because that's what it talks about. Because he is my right hand. That's speaking of his strength. Because he's relying upon the strength of God. He's not going to be moved from where he's standing at. He's not going to be moved. He's, he's setting the Lord always before me. I have set the Lord always. Is the Lord always set before you? Is that, is that uh, the chief of your life, the king of your life, the Lord of your life? Is that your master passion? Is he your strength or are you still living on your own strength and chasing other things? Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope and peace. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol. Now, Sheol really is uh, Hades, um, is the way it's translated in our text in Acts chapter 2. It can mean hell. It can be translated uh, in, as hell. But it's really uh, the place or the state of the departed souls when somebody dies. 
So it hasn't been decided where, but it's actually it translated, Hades is translated as hell in the Old Testament. It really probably should be Sheol in the New Testament because it's the place of the departed souls. It's where you go. But it's really speaking of the grave or the tomb. Um, and, and so he says, you'll not leave my soul there. And of course, David knows that one day he's going to raise again, right? Because God's the God of the living. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're alive still. They're alive right now. See, God's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And so he knows that he's going to raise one day. But as the Holy Spirit takes you, you can also see that he's talking about that Christ will not be left in Hades. He has peace of God that he knows that his soul is not going to be left in the grave. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And of course, the Holy One, it means hallowed or sacred or pure. It's the one that's undefiled with sin. And that's Christ, undefiled by sin. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption or decay. And this is a, a, a messianic prophecy. And he says in 11, you will show me the path of life. And it's the progress or the journey of life. It's the way of life. I think it's actually up in uh, Acts 2. It says the way of life, right? The ways of life. It's a highway. And life, again, listen to me. We do this every time we get to life. Life. Everybody has eternal life. But we're talking about the quality, not the quantity. Everybody's going to live eternally somewhere, whether it's going to be separated from God in hell and outer darkness or with God. And that's the question. Christ died so that we can have life with God for eternity. But we're souls that are going to live forever. When you see the word life, you need to know that it's the word zoe. And it's about the quality of not the quantity. What is the quality of life because of what you're setting before your eyes? You will show me the path of life in your presence and before his face, speaking of his favor, is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And this is where Christ is actually even seated right now as we closed out Chapter, or we went through Acts chapter 1. Remember, they're standing there and they watch him ascend. And he was seated at the right hand of the Father. And they said, man of Galilee, why do you stand looking? This same Jesus will come in like manner. And now Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting there, which is the, the power. That's uh, right hand is always talking about the power. He's the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And, he, and he's sitting there until the Father tells him to come get us, which is going to be the rapture of the church, which is the next big event. Listen, the next big event for the church will be the rapture of the church. But the church is so focused on the world, they're looking at the things going on in the world as the next big event of their life. What is your eyes seeking? Where are you looking at? What are you setting before you? It's got nothing to do with this world. We're in the world to be witnesses. Not to be deceived by what they're doing, but to be witnesses. The world is so evil. It's underneath the sway of the wicked one. Why would we ever look at it for counsel? Why would we ever look to it to, for, to design the way that our life should be lived when God has given us his word and his spirit to lead us? Why would we try to look like the world and act like the world and be like the world and do the things that the world is doing? When we know that they're going to be cast into hell. Why would we want to mimic that darkness? And yet that's exactly what our sin nature always wants to do. That's why God had so many laws about don't do like the people next to you. Don't, don't carve your bodies. Don't tattoo your bodies. He had all of these. Don't prostitute your daughters. Don't do this. Don't do that. Because that's what the people they were looking at were doing. And they wanted to be like them instead of desiring to want to be like God. And God comes and dies and raises again, so that if you believe that he can live in your heart and you can desire to be like him and, and always be set, setting him before you and his ways before you, so that our lives can change. And we have proof of this in the resurrection, that this is who it is, that this is who the Messiah is. And yet we still look to the world and go, oh, I like that. I think I'll do exactly what they're doing. 
How can we say we have salvation if the world is what is leading our life and we're setting their habits and their entertainment and their books and their literature and their music and their movies and their lives forever before us instead of the word of God? How can we ever claim to be children of God and that we understand the resurrection and salvation? It just doesn't make sense. And believe me, well, God is once again going to shake everything. Listen to this. He said, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. But once again, he's going to shake everything. And right now, could be that shaking where the people are shaking and going, oh, and then they're walking away from God. And they're, they're trusting in the world to protect them. They're trusting in medicine and everything else to protect them instead of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm not speaking against medicine. I'm saying always go to God first. Go to God first because what we do is we run to the world first. And then we go, God, bless what I'm doing in the world. Bless what I'm doing in the world. Come on and follow me. Instead of running to God and saying, Lord, what should I do? What should I do? How should I live? How do I deal with these circumstances? What are you teaching me through this? What are you setting before you? Do you have joy in his presence? That's a, I mean, that's a big question. You don't have to be walking around going, cheese in it, like I'm just so full of joy. Joy is an inner calm. It's peace. It's rest because you know what the Lord is doing and that he's sovereign. Now, back in our text in Acts 2 verse 29 listen what Peter does he's doing the same thing that we're doing right now Peter sets the precedent first usages he takes a scripture and he tells them what it means he tells them what the Holy Spirit was saying what was going on and look what he does here in 29 men and brethren let me speak freely to you just let me speak openly to you in the open air here uh, to you of the patriarch that just means a uh, patriarch is, is the head of the family it's where uh, it's the progenitor or the founder of a tribe a people they all coming from David from the loins of David the tribe of Judah coming through this now watch that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us this day. Now, I haven't been to Israel, but people that go to Israel, they said you can actually see from where they were standing in the temple, in the temple area, that you could actually see where David's tomb was planted and he could have been pointing at it. I thought, that's pretty amazing. It's right there. They see it all the time. They worship almost David like they do Moses. Instead of worshiping God, they've walked away. And so he says he's right here with us this day. Therefore... Verse 30, being a prophet, therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And so he gives us the, the actual interpretation of Psalm 16 and what is going on and what David is talking about. But listen, look, you notice he was a prophet? David was a prophet. That's pretty amazing. He was a king and he was a prophet. And, and, and you know what? The only person that's ever been a king and a prophet and a priest is Jesus, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so there's, there's, there's three offices of government that God has, the, the prophet, the king, and the priest. And so that's how our government is set up in America, is with, with uh, three branches to keep each other accountable, just like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's all set up that way. But David, interestingly enough, was a king and a prophet, and then nobody has held, held them all except for Jesus uh, held all three titles. He was a prophet, he was a king, uh, and he was a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. But notice what he says, him being a prophet, knowing, uh, the word I do, he said he, had, he understood and he seen it. He understood and he seen it. Um, that God had sworn with an oath 
to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up to Christ to set on his throne. You know what? Let's just go look at that. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, some of you might remember this. It was a great chapter when we went through it. 2 Samuel chapter 7 uh, gives us the actual... Did I not mark that? I thought I did. 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'm just going to start in verse 1. I thought I marked that this morning. I guess I didn't. During the reign of David, the tribe of Judah, the southern tribes, and pretty amazing that it's chapter 7 by divine... Let's just start in verse 1, and we'll read quickly. Now it came to pass, Haya, when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around. See, that's the position of the saint. We have rest. We have peace from all of our enemies all around. Christ came to defeat the works of the devil. So if we know Christ, then we have rest, and we have no enemies anymore. The only thing that deceives us is our own heart and our own choices because we don't get into the word, prayer, and fellowship and live for Jesus. That the king said to Nathan, the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Now notice this, the heart of David. Listen to me. God has given David peace, and so what does he do? He's concerned about God now. Who's he setting before him? He set God before him now. And he's like, I'm living and I'm being comfortable, but what about God? See, and so if God has given you rest, now you should be concerned about the things of God. And that's what David is saying here. As he looked about, he's like, wow, I should be grateful. I should be concerned about God in his house. Um, then Nathan said to the king, now this is the prophet, listen, go do all that is in your heart for the Lord is with you. And that's actually premature because we're going to find out. They, neither one of them asked God. Did you notice that? So it's an earthly king, earthly prophet. You have to choose to listen to God, but you have to also choose to ask God. Neither one of them asked God about it. So watch what happens. Verse 4. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house for me to dwell in? Notice that. That's the heart of David. The heart of man is to do the work to build the house for God. Um, can be a good thought, but Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We can't build nothing in the flesh of our own. So he says, would you build me a house? And in verse 6, um, for I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Now, that's very interesting, too, isn't it? Because when you look at the analogy of God bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, well, he's brought us out of the world, and now he lives in our tent. We have earthly tents. He lives in our heart. He's living in us, and he's made us the tabernacle. And you're going to see that. Just keep watching. Verse 7, that was 6, by the way. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, what have you not, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? And so God in, in 2 Samuel 7, 7 says, Have I ever said to you, Why didn't you build me a house? Why didn't you do this for me? He's never asked for a house. And then new beginning, now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David. Remember, he's talking to Nathan the prophet. This is what I want you to tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler 
over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore as previously. And that's speaking of the uh, millennial kingdom too, uh, in, in, in uh, that sense where Israel is restored completely. He's given them the land and they've never been able to uh, uh, occupy the land completely and the people continue to try to take it. even this day that war with Hamas against Israel is to try to take God's inheritance it's the same thing that's going on though in the Christian world that when you're not listening to the inheritance and reading the word of God and hiding it in your heart and putting the Lord before your face then you don't know what God has done for you you don't know the inheritance and the enemy's trying to steal the entire inheritance from you because you don't understand the boundaries you don't understand what God has done we don't look at our identity and how our salvation has set us free and our only enemy really right now is us our decisions to be doers and not hearers only deceiving yourself the truth is already given to us yet we don't read the word of God we don't spend time in prayer with God we don't spend time in fellowship with the body of Christ we're chasing and being entertained by the world that's underneath the sway of the wicked one living out in dead men's tombs and why would we want to be like them and it's just, it's utter deception. It's apostasy. And um, I can't say it enough that we all get led astray. And once again, all are sleeping when the sound of the alarm comes, the trumpet. Um, verse 11, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. A royal dynasty, actually, is what it means. I will make you a royal dynasty. And, of course, speaking of what uh, uh, Peter is preaching about in Acts chapter 2. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your own body, that was the flesh that we've seen up in Acts 2, and I will establish his kingdom. Now this is speaking of the Messiah coming from the, 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 the tribe of Judah, but through the patriarch David, through his loins, through his seed, that's where his seed comes, out of his loins, okay? He shall build a house for my name. So Jesus is the one building a house for God's name. His character, his nature, his will, his authority. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. Notice who it is. Let's look at this. He's the father. He's the son. Now listen, it's speaking of Solomon too at the same time. That's the amazing thing. It's a dual prophecy that David is putting everything together and, and he's not going to be able to build this temple, but Solomon will. And, and, and Solomon means peace. And who's Jesus? The Prince of Peace. So it's speaking of both of them. But Solomon is building an earthly temple that's going to crumble. And there's an eternal kingdom that Jesus builds because he dies for the sins of the world. And he raises again. And he is the Messiah. And, he, and Jesus, or excuse me, God is his father and he shall be his son. Uh, if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. And of course, he took our iniquity. He took our sin. See, Solomon was punished. So the, the, father did, the, the father did take care of him, but not during his day. Listen, it says, it says, I won't, because you have walked away from me. Solomon walked away, the wisest man ever. He was not supposed to multiply wives. He had 300 wives and 700 concubines. He was not supposed to multiply anything. He was supposed to trust in God. And when he was humble and when he first come on the throne, he said, ask for, God said, ask whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And he said, give me wisdom to rule these people, that there are so many. 
But by the end of it, he was, he was living his own. He was making his own. He had built three temples to false gods. And because he walked away from the Lord and had done these things, God said, I'm going to punish you, but not in your day. I'm going to do it with your son. And so when Rehoboam come to the throne, that's when the kingdoms were divided. When Rehoboam come, his son. And so then God punished the nation of Israel at that time and separated them and it separated. But what he was doing was separating out Judah so he could separate, separate out David's throne. So he could separate and lead that lineage all the way up to Jesus being born. And this is what they would have understand. They're sitting here, listen to me. We're talking about just the promise of God to have somebody on the throne forever. But they're sitting there going, man, we thought he was the Messiah. We yelled, Hosanna. Man, and then they killed him and they put him in the grave. And then for the last 50 days, all we've heard is that the grave was empty. And the grave was, there's nobody in the grave. That tomb was empty and that he's resurrected. And that's all we've heard about. And now this great sound and now these tongues of fire. And now look at all this commotion on this morning here. And Peter's explaining to them from the scriptures exactly what's going on and where the foundation was started at. It's so amazing to watch this. So again, 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be his father. He shall be my son. I, I took my pen and capitalized that S, even though it's speaking of Solomon. I just made it a capital because it's fucking speaking more about Jesus. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. He was scourged, he was whipped, he was beaten. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, which is a picture of the Antichrist. He took his spirit away from man's king, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. He says it. Uh, twice there forever it's an eternal kingdom according to all these words and according to all this vision so nathan spoke to david so he tells you now that it, it was it was a vision in his dream at night when god came to him let's go back to acts chapter 2 so as he's explaining this he, he, he david being a prophet he knew that god had sworn with this oath and gave god had gave him this promise that, that he was going to raise up from his loins, from his seed, from his body. That's verse 30, Acts chapter 2. Um, For seeing this, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul would not be left in Hades. Now he's tying in uh, 16 of Psalms that we already read. Nor his flesh see corruption, see decay. His flesh did not see decay, which is... Uh, what happens when the body um, is in the grave is decay. I didn't even do that word, did I? That's interesting. What was wrong with my brain? So 32 now, verse 32. Then, or this Jesus, he goes on to explain, this Jesus of Nazareth, remember it ties into verse 22, Jesus of Nazareth, whom they're all talking about. Everybody there knows. You know, you and I down the corridor of time, we're thinking, who's he talking about? But everybody there, that's the hubbub. For three and a half years, Jesus has done miracles and signs and wonders. They've been seeing them. It's been testified by God. He's given testimony. This is my Messiah. And then when he didn't perform the way they wanted and set up a kingdom, they said, crucify him, crucify him. And God always knew that. This Jesus, God has raised up Here's, uh, that's the word anahistamine, like antihistamine, it's antihistamine, antihistamine. Of which we are all witnesses. Notice there, you get your word martyr. This is what we're talking about, Mart martis, one who is mindful of. To be a witness for God and serve him by testimony. Listen, this is what we're called to do as witnesses, as martyreos, as ones who've been given power to be a witness, to be a martyr. We're supposed to serve him by giving testimony, by being doers and by speaking the word of God. 
This is what Peter's doing right now, is he's worshiping God by telling people the truth of what is going on in the world. They're standing there going, what is going on? And they're mocking God's people, and they're talking about them, and they're saying they're drunk, and they don't know what they're doing. And Peter, clearly by the power of the Holy Spirit, takes them to Scripture in their mind because they know the Word of God, and he speaks to them, and he tells them exactly what's going on and who this Jesus was, and think about about the people that are there. And once again, let me just be redundant. Three and a half years, miracles, signs, and wonders. And, and, and then they see this Jesus. They're all yelling, Hosanna, the week before, or, or 60 days before. Hosanna, Hosanna. And he doesn't do what he's supposed to do. So they yell, crucify him. The hubbub is, is that the grave is empty. He's risen. And now they're thinking, wow, was this the Messiah? In their minds, they got stuff going on. What did we do? How did we live? What is going on in life? Are these religious rulers right? Are these people right? And then Peter who they know was a fisherman. He stands up in the midst of them and gives this sermon that points to the, it's a three-point sermon because he quotes three scriptures, but he alludes to about 20 others. But he alludes to this and he speaks to them clearly to their conscience. And you see in 41, because they received the testimony of the word of God, 3,000 of them got saved. He didn't have any smoke and mirrors. He didn't have any electric guitars. He didn't have a microphone. He didn't have anything except the Holy Spirit to use him and speak to him as he had cried out to God and said, what is going on? And he knew, though, what did he know? Jesus said, when you return to me, strengthen the brethren. How do you strengthen brethren? You tell them the truth. You speak the truth in love. How do you build people up? You walk it out. You don't make up Easter bunnies. You don't make up more lies and say, well, I just want my kids to open eggs and open this and open that. And I always get in trouble for this because people go, well, you, have, you always do Christmas presents and you always, you always practice Christmas. Christmas is about the birth of Jesus, and we make sure that we put that platform out there. We don't have Santa Clauses in the house. But listen to me. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, we're playing church. The resurrection is the evidence that Christ was the Messiah and that our sins can be forgiven by the blood of Jesus. And when you start covering that up, you've got some serious problems. You can argue about the virgin birth. I believe it has to be there. Because he has no father that's from Adam. He has no sin nature. He's born of the father in heaven. He just said he will be my father. I will be his father and he will be my son. He declares it plainly. In fact, let's look at, at Isaiah 9. He declares it plainly in Isaiah 9. You guys know this scripture maybe by heart. Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. See, the child was born to God, and then the son was given to us by the Father. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I said Wonderful Counselor on purpose. It's one word. You should take that comma out of there. Look at this. Of the increase, verse 7, of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Listen, the government, the power, everything about the character and the nature and the will is going to be upon his shoulder. Everything about his kingdom is carried by him. Are you putting him always before your face. Look at Luke. Uh, Uh-oh. Now you really got yourself in trouble. Luke. I don't have my quote before me. I'm thinking. Well, it's Luke. Go to Luke. Head that way and I'll find it. Luke chapter 1. Head to Luke. Luke chapter 1. It's quoted in Luke chapter 1. You just read it. Um, 
32. And these are all in your margins, by the way. I'm not making any of these up and I didn't find them myself. Uh, it's in your margin in, in, in any Bible. Speaking of his names will be Jesus, is Luke 131. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. Those uh, uh, Jacob means supplanter and deceiver. Over the sinners, over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And, and again, it, it's just over and over and over that he's sitting on this throne. And, and, and Peter's telling them that this Jesus whom God raised up out of the grave, this Jesus is who we are witnessing about. This is who we're talking about. Are you talking about him? Is this who you're witnessing about? Now, while you're in Luke, you might as well stay in Luke, and we're going to go to Luke 24, because what are they talking about? What is the hubbub? What's going on? Uh, we're talking about the... Of course, the tongues and the great and mighty wind that sounded like a wind... And, and, but, but they're talking still about the grave being empty. This Jesus raised from the dead. This Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And of course, today is Resurrection Sunday. I want to say it again. It's not, it's not about Easter. That word is in the Bible one time in the King, in the King James. It's a bad word. It's not good. It's from, the, it's from a, a, a pagan fertility god, Ishtar. She's the goddess of war and sexual love. This is Resurrection Sunday, and this year, is, this year in America, it's even worse than ever, okay? Let me tell you, because it's 24 days away still before it's even Resurrection Sunday in Israel. 24 days. This is way off this year, and it's because they add an extra month to their calendar every so often, and this year, I mean, it's it's not even until it's it's Adar Adar uh, uh, the second. It's a, the twenty first day of it. Not even the month of Nisan yet. It's not even it's not even the right month yet over there. And we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday, and we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. It's just wrong this year for some reason. It's pretty bad. I don't understand it. Not Pentecost, because we're on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But today is Resurrection Sunday. The day they come, and we're going to see here, Luke 24, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, that's why we celebrate on the first day of the week, Sunday, church, very early in the morning, they, they who, who's they? Look up back up at 2355. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So they went back. So they followed the men, Joseph of Arimathea and everybody. They put him in the grave. They knew where it was at. And then you see them, they, early in the morning, come after the Sabbath's over, and certain other women with them, and, now listen, there's a bunch of women here, right? Remember we talked about this. Why is it all women? Because when you would kill some, when the Roman government would kill a leader, when they would take somebody and get rid of them, they would try to come and get all the other men because the men were the leaders. So the women can move around freely like this, but the men can't because the men are hiding because they're afraid they're all going to die. They're hiding behind uh, walls somewhere. And we're going to see in a minute, a couple of them here are going to run down there. But they're hiding because they know that the, the, the government usually kills all the other ones so that you don't just get rid of the leader and then somebody else step up and take over, but they crush out the entire thing. Much like Israel's doing right now with Hamas, saying, we're not just going to take out one or two, we're going to take out all of it. We're done with them attacking our people and killing innocent people. And uh, so we have to be careful with what we say with these things. So they come very early in the morning, all the women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So they had already prepared. They've been planning. They've been doing things. Are you prepared? Are you preparing? What are you preparing for? Your next vacation? 
Listen, are you watching and waiting and working? Are you preparing for the Lord's coming? Are you preparing for your wedding? Because we're the bride of Christ. We're supposed to be putting on our wedding garment, taking off our flesh and our death and putting on the newness of life and being clothed in Christ, we're told over in Colossians 3. We're supposed to be clothed in Christ, putting on that wedding garment to be walking down the aisle with him when we get to heaven. So they had prepared. Verse 2. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They came back. They were concerned about the Lord. And now they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Isn't that amazing? This, listen, I was reading something. on it. I forget what it was. It generally took 20 men to roll a stone away from a tomb. Because the way they would set it up so it doesn't roll away by itself, it was kind of on a little decline. And it's a big stone that covered a door where you could walk into this tomb. And, you know, you stoop down a little bit, but it's still a big door. And it generally took about 20 men to roll away a stone. And there's only like two guards. If you read the other accounts, there's like two guards. Who's rolled away this stone? Why is the stone rolled away? See, because Jesus didn't need the stone to be rolled away to get out. He doesn't need the stone to be rolled away. He, he can walk right through it. We're going to see him come right through the walls. He's, he's a spirit. It's rolled away so we can see in. God rolls away the stone from your heart so that you can see the truth of the gospel. And then what do you do with it? Do you continue to set him before your face daily? you continue to get into the word and learn truth and walk in the newness of life and come out of the grave like Lazarus did? Or do you continue to hang out and say, now, nah, right now, I, I, got, I got my own choices. I can just stay in this tomb. I'm not going to investigate. I'm not going to look for the truths of God. I'm going to continue to live in darkness and live in death and chase everything the world is chasing and live according to that. Listen, God rolls away the stone, your stony heart, so you can see that he has given new life. And it's your choice. It's not just one prayer. That's the biggest false lie of the church, of the church age. You say one prayer at an altar and you're done. And then the devil deceives you into running right back out and picking up all of your old grave clothes and putting them back on and living in sin and thinking that you're okay. And you put the stone right back over your heart and you say, don't talk to me. Don't judge me. You're not the boss of me. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to live for Jesus. I already believe in Jesus. You know how many people are going to hell because they're deceived by that? You know how many people are going to hell when they've been given free life salvation and they choose to ignore jesus and the relationship that you have to have with him oh you're saved by grace through faith and it's not of yourself it is a gift of god not of works lest any man should boast but if you are saved the holy spirit is here now to clothe you in christ likeness to clothe you in your wedding garment to to prepare you as a chaste virgin to be handed over to Christ in heaven and then he walks us down the aisle and he delivers us all back to the father he becomes the kinsman redeemer and he marries us back in to his family it's such an amazing picture that's going on here but listen they come and they look for him because they wanted to finish with his burial and they find the stone rolled away. See, they, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah that was going to rule and reign, right? Uh, you know, uh, they, or excuse me, opposite. They believed that he was going to set up everything again right then and there. And so when he died, they said, he's not the Messiah. He died. But you know why they believed that? Because they weren't praying and studying the word. They were just listening to men. And the men told them that when the Messiah comes, he will set up a kingdom. It will be like the days of Solomon and everything will be great again. He'll overthrow these Romans and we'll rule everything again. See, that's the millennial. That's the second coming. And they ignored the first coming when he came as a suffering servant, his first advent, and he died for the sins of the world. Then he came on a donkey. And so because they listened to men and not to God, because they listened to men and not to God, they missed the Messiah. 
And that's what's going on in the church today. People are listening to men with AI. They have artificial intelligence where they read a commentary and they get up and they say what the commentary said. And if the commentary doesn't line up with the word of God, they just keep preaching it. Let's just keep preaching it no matter what it says because it sounds like it's good. Instead of spending time with God and understanding what his word says and letting the Holy Spirit lead you and train you and teach you. See, Peter is being led by the Holy Spirit in his sermon. At this time where we're looking at in Luke 24, which is going on with the tomb is empty, they're still confused. Peter and them still freaking out. Watch this. So the, the, the stone is rolled away, but it's not rolled away for Jesus to get out. It's rolled away so you and I can investigate. It's rolled away so everybody will see that the grave is empty. Just like when the rapture happens, what happens? Does God need to bust the graves open? It says the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall meet the Lord in the air, and thus will be with him always. In the rapture of the church, does God need to break open the graves in order to bring those bodies that are going to be in a twinkling of an eye, they're going to be changed in the air. No, he does it on purpose as evidence to prove that the graves were open, to prove that the word of God is true, to prove that people got up out of the grave. People are going to be saying, the graveyards, the graves are open everywhere. Whatever could this mean? Think on it for a moment, and they're going to see the evidence of all the empty graves of the saints that went before. And they're going to go, wow, this is what this is what they were talking about, them Christians, that this would happen, that the graves would open, and the grave can't hold them. Because just as sure as the grave couldn't hold Jesus, it can't hold us. He's the resurrection and the life. Because he rose, we will raise with him in the resurrection. Listen to me, it's going to be a big witness. It's going to be big evidence to the world. And that's what the empty tomb is to us. God wants people to see that, but then to make a decision to keep investigating. But what has to happen first? How can they know unless somebody tells them? Look, what, it's Romans chapter 10, by the way. Look what happened. Verse 3, what did the women do? See, the women represent the church now. They represent me and you. Then they went in and did not find the body. They were looking for the body of the Lord Jesus. Guess what? We're the body. You and I, the body. We're the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians um, 12. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Where's that at? Two men stood by them in shining garments. It's really interesting. Uh, the shining garments to flash as lightning, to shine. Isn't that interesting? The clothing and apparel. Because see, the enemy, the devil, can come as, a, as an angel of light. That's what he tried to do when he quotes scripture to Jesus. He tries to come as an angel of light. And he tries to tell you a, a, a half-truth from scripture. Oh, yeah, they, them Jesus freaks, they're saying that this means this, but this is really what it means. And the angel of light comes, and he and he it pretends to be telling you the gospel. The, the, the synagogues of Satan and the Antichrist, they pretend to be telling you the gospel, but it's not a gospel of Jesus. It's not the true gospel. It's all over our, our world today. But anyway, it means a, 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 to flash as lightning, these shining garments. Now, I, again, believe, and you can throw it out, I'll throw it out to you, and you can throw it out. I again believe it's the, 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 the Father and the Spirit. I just believe that. I believe they're all three at the grave. I believe they're all three at his ascension. I believe they're all three at Abraham's tent. I believe they're all three at Sodom and Gomorrah. I believe they're all three involved in salvation and sanctification. They're all three involved in all of the stuff that's going on in your life and my life because it's God. He's the Spirit. I believe he's involved in that. You have to listen to the Father who sent the Son, who asked the Father to send the Spirit. But that's just my opinion. Uh, it says that, verse 5, 
Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces, this is not a word for worship, by the way. They just bowed their faces to the earth in fear. Are you bowing your face to the earth in fear, but not worshiping God? You just bow in fear because you don't understand what's going on, so you just cower away. You listen to me. This is very important. And, and what happened? Uh, these these uh, two men, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? And I would ask you that question this morning. If we believe in the resurrection, why do we believe in Easter? Why would we follow Easter if we believe in the resurrection? Why would we look for the living among the dead pagan culture that Constantine started, Babylonian goddess of Ishtar? If we believe in Jesus, why would we be in the graveyard looking for the living among the dead? Why would we go to the world to turn into sway of the wicked one and full of dead men's bones? Every grave, every place you go, it's they're dead. We're the ones with the living God living in us. We have the living truth. We have a new and living way. We're supposed to go and tell them about Jesus, and we go and adopt their culture, their practices, their ways. We want to hear from them. There's something upside downward. And these two men would ask them, why are you seeking the living among the dead? You, if you want to seek the living, he's a living God. He's here right now. You find him in the word, prayer, and fellowship. And we begin to, to come together and become the body of Christ. And people can see it when they're looking. They go, there's a body of Christ over there that's really amazing. I'd like to go see what they're doing. And you see the body of Christ because Christ is the head. And how do they see it? When we're loving one another. Not when we're loving the world and the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life, but when we're loving one another and overlooking transgression and extending grace and mercy and being the body of Christ by being witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, being witnesses to the power of the Holy Spirit that is leading us, that's when they see the body of Christ. Why would we be looking for the living? Oh, I've got this problem. I think I'll go to the world for help instead of praying. Oh, I've got this issue. I think I'll go to the world and see how they can help me take care of myself. I'll go to the world and see how they can do this for me. Listen to me. If you, I'm not telling you never go to the world. I mean, if, you're, if your toilet's stopped up and you need a plumber, I want a good plumber. I don't care if he's a Christian plumber. Or, I, I, this is serious. But shouldn't you pray first? Especially if it happens a lot. Maybe God wants you to go buy an auger instead of keep feeding the plumber. Maybe you should learn how to unstop the toilet. Maybe you should deal with the, what's causing the stoppage. Listen, I'm just saying, maybe we should pray for wisdom instead of going to the world for help. Why is it happening? And that's a crazy uh, analogy there. But you fill in the blank. Maybe it's your, your big toe and your bunion. I, I don't care what it is. Did you pray about it first? Did you ask about it first? Did you say, Lord, what's causing this first? Maybe you keep kicking your toe on the bed and you should put something in the way so you don't kick the bed. You know, these are, this is just pure wisdom. Instead of going to the doctor or going for help or crying out and thinking that the world can help us. Because what it does is trains your heart to always look to the physical and to the physical help. Instead of training your heart in the way it's supposed to go, always look into God. It's, he's the one with the strength. He's the one with the power. He's the one with the mind. Why would you look for the living among the dead? I pray that you're not doing that. Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Nobody said He has risen indeed. And so number six, listen, this is the number of man. This is the message that man needs to hear. This is the first sermon of the church we've talked about. And what's Peter bringing up? How many times? Resurrection. And now here it is again before the first sermon of the church. He is not here, but is risen. Listen, he has risen. Come on, now you can get livelier than this. He is risen indeed, Pastor Green. Good job. 
Now listen, remember, because this is what we do. This is the word remember. It's a memorial. We remember exactly with communion. We remember his death, burial, and resurrection until he comes. Now look, he is risen. He is risen indeed. He's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. Listen, that's the rest of the six. Rest of six. You can't remember how he spoke to you unless you read the word of God. You can't remember the word of God unless you learn the word of God. Now, this is the word that it spoke here is Rhema because it was out loud. They were walking with him for three and a half years and he was telling them what's going to happen. He was telling them what's going to happen next. He told them everything. He counseled them. He shared with them. He was the great physician. He was the king. He was a teacher. And he's speaking to them. And as these two remind them, they remember, wow, he did say, look, and this is what you're supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be doing. The true church is supposed to be learning the word of God so the Holy Spirit can give you remembrance of it when you need it so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. We talked about it Friday night, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You're prepared. You're preparing just like these ladies did. But what did they prepare to do? The wrong thing. They prepared to look in an empty tomb. They prepared to look in a grave. And Jesus had already said, I'm going to rise. And it took remembrance from these two men. He's not here, but he's risen. And then they go, wow, you know, we remember he said, when we were still in Galilee, which is the heathen circle, and six has got full of the heathen circle, saying seven, listen, this is how you get better, completed. The Son of Man must be delivered. What? He can't deliver us unless he's delivered to them. He can't deliver us from the sin nature unless he dies according to his appointed calling. He was the Messiah. He was the Messiah of God. For this purpose, he came to be the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He must be delivered. You can't change it. You can't stop it. Because God had already planned it that way. God had already spoken to David this way, that from your seed, the Messiah will come. And David spoke of the resurrection. It all fits together perfectly. It had to be done. He must need be delivered or you and I will not be delivered. Delivered where? Into the hands, into the power of sinful men and be crucified, nailed to a tree and the third day rise again. See, remember he kept telling him, I think he told him like six or seven, eight times on the way to Jerusalem. What are you guys arguing about right there? Hey, you know, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. On the third day, I'm going to rise again. He kept saying it. And they were so busy with their own little fleshly arguments. Who was the greatest and what I was going to do. And, and oh, he, I think we forgot to get bread. And they were so busy with all these things that they weren't listening to what he was saying was going to happen afterwards. And so often we're so busy with life we don't listen and put the word of God first and remember what Christ has said I will never leave you nor forsake you Listen, I will provide for all your needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus I will complete the work I started in you until the day of Christ Jesus let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you but where I go I go to prepare a place for you and if I go I'll come back again to receive you to myself I mean he said so many words and if you hide them in your heart you know you can stand firm and witness for the gospel of Christ instead of looking for the living among the dead that was, that was what was wrong with the Pharisees, remember? It was the Sadducees that actually tried to trick him in that text where he says, you know, there was a man who had a wife and he died. And then uh, his wife uh, was supposed to marry one of the brethren, but he had seven brethren and she married them all. And in the resurrection, who's he going to be? Whose wife is she going to be? And he says, you are sadly, you are greatly mistaken because you do not know the power of God nor the word of God. That was the problem they had. That's how they apostatized. They didn't understand the power of God or the word of God. And they made up their own gospel. Much like we've done in the church today. 
dress up, celebrate Easter and Christmas, and then uh, say a prayer and you get to go to heaven. And then everybody can say they're in a better place, which is probably a lie from the pit of hell. On our church van, we used to have a sticker that said, live so the pastor don't have to lie when you die. That's what I would love for everybody to do, to live so that I don't have to lie when you die. That the evidence would be clear in your life that you're sold out for Jesus. Because that's really the only Christian, the one that's willing to live for Jesus. Willing to die for your faith. That's what a martyr is. That's what one who becomes a witness is. Where are we at? Anyway, they remembered it. Do you remember the word of God? This is how we're going to be sanctified and cleansed, is verse 7, uh, is remembering the truth of what God's word has already said. That on the third day he would rise again. Now, new, new, new beginning, verse 8. And they remembered his words. It's a great memory verse. Five words. And they remembered his words. Are you memorizing God's word? I was sharing scripture with somebody. They go, man, you know a lot of scripture. And I go, well, somebody told me when I was a young Christian to memorize scripture. And so for 27 years, uh, we've been memorizing scripture. Every Friday night in our Bible study, we give a person a chance to quote it out loud. And sometimes we do it just out of just, just, it's just going through the motions. But if you chew on that word and you meditate on that word and you learn that word, you begin to understand it. And when you draw near to God, he draws near to you and he uses his spirit to draw that word up out of you. Not in any way trying to point to me. I'm trying to point to the fact that we need to remember his word. But you cannot remember his word if you've never remembered it. You have to remember it first. If you don't remember it, you can't remember it. Some of you will get that later. They remembered his word. That's the new beginning. The living word is Christ. Do you remember him? Are you sitting before your face every day? Are you spending time with him? Are you growing in the grace and the knowledge of him? Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. What? Are you serious? They went and became witnesses? They remembered his word and they go, hey, we remember his word. Let me tell you about his word. Look what happened. He rose on the third day just like he said. And then what happened, Greg, after people witnessed to other people? Look at verse 10. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things. See, these women became witnesses, all of us. Their rebellion became a witness. Mary means their rebellion. Um, 11, and their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. See, you got, you got, you got, you got this thing going on. When you share the gospel, sometimes people won't believe, sometimes people will. This first sermon Peter's going to give, 3,000 people are going to receive the word of God. An incredible story or a tale. An amazing testimony is what it is. That's what the idle words mean. It seemed to them like idle words, and they did not put their trust in them. But look at verse 12. But Peter arose, this is Peter giving the sermon in the book of Acts, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb. He didn't walk down. Let me just casually go down and see if this is true. He ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths, linen clothes, uh, cloths lying by themselves and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. So he ran to investigate. He became like a Berean. Listen, when you have witness of the word of God to you about what God is doing, about what the Holy Spirit is doing, you should run to find out if it's true. And if it is, apply it to your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to use it in your life. That's what the word of God is for. He ran and checked it out. And then he departed. And then what happened, Greg? Greg? We're looking at it in Acts chapter 2. Let's go back there. We're looking at what happened after he's seen that Jesus resurrected. In fact, if you kept going, you'd have the road to Emmaus where Jesus comes and meets with a couple of them. They can't recognize him. They don't recognize him. His appearance is a little bit altered. And he walks with them. And he begins to tell them all the times in the Old Testament that it testified of what must happen to the Messiah. 
of what had to happen. Because the Old Testament word is always going to be fulfilled. It's always going to be true. Back in our text, after verse 32, this Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. This is what they were talking about. And then Jesus is with them. Acts chapter 1 says, for 40 days, speaking to them of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he's with them 40 days, and then he ascends, and then they sit down for 10 days waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit in the upper room, and then the big sound of wind, and then the as of tongues, and then the mocking, and then the, they're full of new wine, and then this sermon comes that Peter is doing, and then verse 33, he tells them what happened to the risen Lord. 33 was how many old he was too. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Look at this. He's telling them, he poured out this which you now see and hear. He, and that was the culmination of what he was doing. He led them all the way through these scriptures to say then he rose from the grave. He sat down at the Father's hand, and the Father gave him the right to send the Holy Spirit back, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the pledge that he would send it, and then he poured it out, and that's why you heard something like a loud wind. That's why you've seen the tongues. That's why you heard people speaking in everybody's language, and God reversed the Tower of Babel and allows people now to communicate with the gospel as a witness by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what you now see and hear. Because they were willing to wait. Are you willing to wait? And then he gives another one. For David, verse 34, did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your foes, your enemies, your footstool. And of course, this is quoting, let's just go there. It's Psalms 110. Let's just look at it. He's still quoting scripture. Psalms 110. Anytime you see a quote of a scripture in the New Testament, it's always, you're supposed to go back and look and see what the rest of it is. That's, it's like me saying, turn to chapter 17. If they would quote scripture, they would have that all being remembered in their heart because they knew scripture. And they would be seeing it. Watch this. Psalms 110, if we read it. The Lord said to my Lord. So, Kurios said to Kurios. That supreme in authority said to supreme in authority. Father God said to the Father Son, sit at my right hand. That's the place of power. That's where Jesus is sitting at right now, praying for you and me. Till I make your enemies your footstool, your foes your footstool. Um... The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, uh, the city of David, rule <coughs> strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing. Yours might say volunteers. It's the word willing in the day of your power. Listen, we're supposed to be willing. Do you remember back in, in, in with the Amalekites? The people were not willing to sacrifice all of these. They brought them back to give them to you, Lord. The people were not willing to kill all of these sheep and these animals. Their heart was not willing to follow the commands of God. But with the Spirit of God, we should be willing to follow God in the day of his power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. It is a messianic psalm. And then look at this uh, white throne judgment here. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. I mean, it's just, it's, to me, it's the, the white throne judgment when he's going to kill kings and the people that are the synagogues of Satan that reject his authority and they're not willing to receive the free gift of eternal salvation through the Messiah. 
the Lord said to my Lord. So he sat down and wait until I, I have vanquished all of your enemies. And what's the last enemy? Death. Hades, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is, where is your sting? Might have said it backward. Hades, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? Listen, the resurrection removes that. Paying for our sin removes that. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's where Jesus is seated right now, making intercession. Ephesians 2 actually says that you and I are seated there with him in heavenly places. That's our position. But practically, we are going to walk it out down here by the word of God, being led by the spirit of God. The same way that Peter and James and all of these boys and then the Paul, they all walked it out. They lived it out. They were witnessing it out. They were given testimony about it was by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can't do it pursuing the world. You have to come out from among them. And when you do, they're going to hate you. They're going to spitefully use you. They're going to speak evil of you like you're doing what's evil instead of them. So 36, and we'll close. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, remember Jesus of Nazareth, verse 22, he told him clearly who he's talking about, whom you crucified, what an accusation, he's pointing at them because they all called for Barabbas, crucify him, crucify him, they all called for Barabbas, both Lord and Christ, both Kurios and Mashiach, Kurios and Mashiach, listen, Kurios, supreme in authority, he's, he's eternal God, and he's the Messiah. He's the anointed. He's the savior of the world. And he clearly says it right there. And he's telling the people of Israel, the Jewish men that are listening, that God has clearly made him both. He's God and he's the Messiah. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Have you met him? Do you know the tomb is empty? Do you know that he has risen? He has risen. Come on, you guys can do this better than this. He has risen. Yes, and he's coming back again soon to take the chosen home. And I pray that you are ready. And final scripture, my brother sent me this this morning because he's always sending me scripture. And I said, well, why would I not just share that? Oh, what's those about? There's some other ones. I didn't go to those. Oh, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. 1125. Go to Hebrews 9. Listen, it's so important that we understand because there's so many false religions out there uh, that tell you that you got another chance and another chance and you can get another chance. But, but Hebrews uh, 9.27 says really clearly, it's appointed for men to die once, and then comes the judgment. And in 28, it says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, the many who believe in him, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation, for the completion of your salvation. To receive, because the, 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 he, he's already put the down payment down. He's paid for us, and he put the earnest money, and he's coming back to, to get the chosen possession. He's going to come back and get that which he paid money down. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit? Are you being led by the Holy Spirit? Are you learning the Word of God so you can remember the Word of God? He's coming back again. He's only going to die once. He doesn't keep getting back on the cross. He offered his body once for sins. He's coming back as a conquering king. Are you ready? Are you eagerly waiting for him and watching and working? Are you understanding the will of God uh, and, and being wise, not as a fool, but redeeming the time for the days are evil? Listen, it's getting worse and worse out there. I don't know if you know, but... Uh, uh, um, I, I really don't, I'm not trying to be political, but they made today National LGBT Awareness Day. 
They purposely placed it upon the day that the American people are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Now, it's 24 days off, so we have no big deal. They're always confused and deluded. But I'm just telling you, they purposely tried to stir up the chaos to get you focused upon the politics and the, the falseness of what they're doing instead of knowing that he has risen. He has risen indeed. That he is going to raise us one day in the resurrection. And our focus should be on the spirit of a man. Not the politics of a man. Not the, the physical of a man. Not the outer appearance of a man. But we should be on the ministry to the soul of a man. Because we have the ministry of reconciliation of souls. So we go by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we witness about Christ. We give testimony of the resurrection and we walk it out in front of them without fear. Without fear. And we become the fragrance of death to those who are perishing, but the fragrance of life to those who are coming to salvation or have life. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. Thank you for giving us boldness to go out and give testimony and be witnesses for your son. We pray for the salvation of souls, Lord. And we pray that you would remove the lies and the apostasy from the church and give people a desire to remember your word because he has risen. He has risen indeed. He has risen indeed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.